wonderful, wonderful songs this morning. We praise the Lord for that. Before we get into the message this morning, I wanted to share with you that uh, we have received the completed drawings for the new, congr- for the new sanctuary uh, from the architect, and we are excited about that. Amen? I hope you're excited about that, especially if you're sitting elbow to elbow to somebody this morning. Amen. And uh, we are going to be getting these plans out uh, to some general contractors to uh, finish getting bids. We have estimates at this point, but we don't have any kind of uh, hard bids on thing. But I'm trying to find one of the pictures that I was looking for. Um, you may not be able to see it that well, but I, I just I got excited this morning and getting ahead of myself just a little bit. But this is real similar to the drawing that we had before. Uh, but you can see in this picture our old building here, and then uh, beside of that will be the new sanctuary. Uh, building's quite a bit bigger than this building. And um, we're going to be getting a large blown-up picture of that that we can put in the foyer that you'll be able to look and be able to see. Uh, we'll put these prints out here before long so people can look through those. Uh, tonight we're going to have a short business meeting, just one motion that needs to come up so that we can get um, some drilling done, some soil testing and so on here at the church and uh, get those things out for bids. And we're looking forward that in this new year, the Lord willing, and if the church approves, uh, we'll be able to break ground on a new sanctuary. And uh, we're excited about that. And I hope that you'll be praying about it. I'm going to watch the weather here in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to have a Sunday. We'll try to pick a Sunday where it's not 32 below, Uh, but we're going to meet uh, just right at the first portion of the service and go over here on this piece of property where this will be built, Lord willing, and uh, have a time of prayer and just ask God's blessing on all of that. We'll join together as a church. We'll have a time of prayer and then we'll come in for our regular service. But I hope you've already been praying. But if, you have, uh, if you've not been praying about this, uh, please add it to your prayer list. And uh, there's already been a lot of work that has gone into this. Uh, it's been a long process. Uh, we've shared many times with you about the issues that we've had uh, with the fire marshal and water and the sprinkling system and all those kind of things. And so uh, with this, we found something that will move forward that we feel we can do and uh, we can enlarge. You know, the Bible speaks of enlarging uh, the stakes of your tent, and that's exactly what we're looking to do. We're looking to enlarge, uh, pull up stakes, enlarge, expand out, make more room, and I hope that uh, you will be praying about that. And in 2019 you will be hearing a lot about uh, the expansion uh, here at the church. So please be praying about that and keep that in mind. All right, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Hope that you have your Bible with you or some electronic copy of God's Word that you can read along with us. We are in the last days of 2018, but to be even more specific, we are in the last hours, period. And we believe that the Lord Jesus is soon to come. Brother Josh and I were here talking yesterday, and we were just talking about the shape that our world is in, and and Brother Josh said, you know, when I look around and I see everything going on, I think, Lord, how much longer? How much longer are you going to tarry with the way that the world is? Well, that's not our call. Uh, That is uh, up to our Heavenly Father. He has said in His Word that uh, no one knows the day nor the hour. That is something that He has reserved, that He has set. But He has told us to be prepared. He has certainly given us the signs of the time for us to be able to know uh, that it is soon to come. But that specific moment, that hour is only known to the Lord. When people come to you and they start predicting to you that the Lord is going to come on a certain date, they are false teachers and you don't need to give them uh, one minute of your time. Amen? Uh, we need to look to the Word of God and what the Word, God, uh, Word of God tells us. 
Let me just say real quick before we go into this, uh, today is Kara's birthday, and uh, 27 years ago today, about this time, uh, we were welcoming our first child into the world. Uh, but now that uh, she's had Charlie and we have a grandchild, if I knew now, if I knew then what I knew now, we would have skipped having Kara and just had Charlie. <laughs> and all the grandparents said, Amen. Amen. You just skip the kids and go straight to the grandkids. Amen. And so, no, we're kidding. Uh, Kara, we're, we're blessed and praise the Lord for her and for Mitchell and Charlie and the blessing they are to our family. And we say happy birthday to her this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You've got to remember that this is a personal letter that we're reading this morning. This is a letter from the hand of the Apostle Paul as he is writing to uh, his young protege, uh, Timothy. As Paul is moving into the latter parts, the latter days of his ministry, he understands that his life is going to be taken before very long for the cause of the gospel. But there are those who are being raised up to fill the gaps that are being left behind. And Timothy is that young man. And so Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him and to assure him, but also to let him know what he will be facing and others will be facing as they carry the gospel and they try to live a Christian life. In verse 1, Paul tells Timothy, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times shall come. He didn't say they might come, things might change. He said these times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent or no self-control, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And Paul gives a warning to Timothy. He says, from such Turn away, for of this sort are they which crept into houses and led captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers or different various lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And for you young people, especially you teenagers and college age young people, let me read that verse to you once again. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And all means all, and that's all all means. Amen? Amen? All Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to the end, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That means to be a mature Christian. He goes on in chapter 4, speaking to Timothy, and he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. To say that there has been a spiritual shift in our world is an understatement. And I believe that that shift has been in the wrong direction. I was talking to a young man last night who made the statement that in just his short life, he has seen how things have changed in our world, spiritually speaking. And I said, well, if you've seen that shift, imagine uh, what I have seen. And for those of you that are of years, I can only imagine the shift that you have seen in the spiritual situation in our world in our country, and even right here in our own communities. Paul told Timothy that there would come a day when all of the evils that are listed in this Scripture would be the norm. It would be the normal of the day. There would come a day when uh, the gospel would be pushed aside, the gospel would be perverted, the gospel would be ignored, the gospel would be twisted into something else, and that these lists of evils would become the norm in our society. And, I, and I've preached from this scripture numerous times and, and broken down these words of what they would mean more in our society today and talked about all these things. And friend, as you read over that list, it's like you're reading the newspaper. It's like you're watching the news. It's like you're walking down the street of Main Street because we see these things. They're in our societies. They're in our homes and they're even in our churches. So when we talk about the last days, Paul in this scripture, he is pointing out the problem. And the problem is this. Paul says, <coughs> Paul says that in the last days, there will be those that will do that which is pleasing to man and not God. Everybody in this room has heard the phrase political correctness. Political correctness is nothing but a fancy term for pleasing men and not God. Because political correctness is this. Let's not offend any man, but we don't care if we offend God. We just don't need to say or do anything that's going to offend other people. Well, let me say this first of all, political correctness is impossible. Because if you do it this way, you offend this group, and if you do it this way, you offend this group. And I learned as a pastor long ago, you can never please everybody. There's an old saying that says you can please everybody some of the time, please some of the people all the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. Amen? It's just impossible. And what one is going to support is going to offend the other. But we are in a society today where we have chosen to be pleasing to man and not pleasing to God. We have ignored the Scripture. We are afraid that we are going to offend someone else. But we don't take into consideration that what we are saying and doing and what we are supporting is offending God. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we're just going to read one verse, but man, what this verse says. Paul again was writing to those that were in the church there at Rome, and he is talking about how uh, ungodliness is on the rampage and how prevalent it is, is in society. And he says in verse 25, Who hath changed the truth of God into a lie, 
and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. I have heard that verse described as this. It is divine abandonment. We have taken that which is godly, we have taken that which is divine, and we have abandoned it, and we have chosen to replace it with a lie. That we have become a society that would rather worship the created than the Creator. That we would rather worship the things that God with His hand has fashioned and made than we would to worship the one that created them. People who, you know, they look at our world today and they're more concerned over baby seals than they are the unborn babies of human beings. More concerned with destroying the egg of, a, uh, of an eagle or something like that than they are uh, the life of a human being. People that are more concerned. And listen, I'm all about taking care of the earth that we have. I'm all about, I, I, you know, I, I think we ought to uh, take care of it. And, and we are, God left us here as stewards of this earth. But the earth is not to be worshipped, and, and the things of the earth are not to be what our affections are set upon. And friend, the Bible says that there is a time when they have changed the truth of God into a lie. We live in a society today where they take this book and they say, it's a lie. You can't believe it. You can't trust it. And we have become a, a people that we worship the things that are created more than the Creator. And let me just throw this in for good measure. There is no such thing as Mother Earth. There's only Father God. Amen? And He made it and He fashioned it with His hands and He left you and I as the stewards and the caretakers of what He has given us. But as we look at the Scripture this morning, in our society there is a divine abandonment of that which is good. And in there in 2 Timothy, Paul speaks about a time when people would be filled with knowledge of the world, but they would be spiritually ignorant. We have never been a more educated society ever. But when you look at people's spiritual education or their spiritual mindset, there is a spiritual ignorance that has swept over our society. I have said it a million times. You could have grown up a few generations ago and never darkened the door of a church, and yet you still knew what the Bible said. You were still exposed to the things of God. There was still an influence from the pulpits and the churches upon society. People that would never darken the door were still learned and schooled in the things of God's Word. It was often taught in our schools and prayer was led before the day began and so on and so forth. You didn't have to come to church to get things of God because it was prevalent in our society. But we have become a society today, we are more concerned with our worldly education than we are with our spiritual knowledge. We're more concerned with knowing two plus two than we are knowing what God has said about sin and salvation. Now parents, listen. God has given you precious gifts and you are to do everything that you can to raise them in the way of the Lord. But if their physical education, if their worldly education is more important to you than their spiritual education, let me encourage you. You're spending two hours a night to teach them how to add numbers and you're not spending time teaching them the Word of God. That's a terrible mistake to make. Paul said there would come a day when they would have the knowledge of the world, but there would be spiritual ignorance. There's nothing wrong with getting a good education. There's nothing wrong with, with getting your bachelor and your master's and your doctorate and, and all of those great things, and we should use every amount of, of, of brain power that we have. As a matter of fact, I think we, we've got a problem in society of a lot of people not using it. Amen. But there's nothing more important than your spiritual education, than your spiritual knowledge. And Paul said that in those dangerous days, that in those perilous days, there would be this knowledge of the world, but a spiritual ignorance. He said there would come a time where there is a form of godliness. What was Paul talking about as a form of godliness? He was talking about a time where there would be perverted religion. There is so much in our world today where the things of God and even religion itself has been perverted. 
Yesterday there was a thing, and I think Daniel sent it to me this morning, of one of the, uh, the, the colleges there in North Carolina where they're setting up the, the, uh, the club for the satanic temple and all of that stuff there on the, on the college campus and all of that. Can I ask you a question? Why is it that the news and the media and the politicians are in such an uproar when a Christian organization tries to do something, but when somebody does something like that, you really don't ever hear of it? You got to hear it on some kind of a, a of a you know some kind of an offsite somewhere that you hear about it. You run across it by accident, but you let the children of God stand up and try to do something, and it's all over the national news. I'll tell you why. Because he just said there would come a day when the good would be bad and the bad would be good. The things that are evil will be celebrated and there will be perverted religion and hypocrisy will run rampant. That's a form of godliness and simply going through the motions. How many times do we walk into the doors of Hurricane Chapel and simply go through the motions? And we never pray for the presence of God to be among us. We never pray for ourselves that our hearts would be open to receive God's Word. That we don't pray for ourselves that we'll come in and offer our worship unto God. That we're not praying for our brothers and sisters. That we're not praying for the ministry and the outreach of our church. And we simply go through the motions. Paul said there would come a day when there would just be a form of godliness. Churches have abandoned the gospel for feel-good pep talks. I read an article a few months ago, and I, I went back in my file. I know that I kept it somewhere, but um, a few months ago, Tammy and Kayla went through my office to organize it. I ain't found anything since. But I read about an interview that a church had, and they were looking, their pastor had left, and so they had put out a thing. They were looking for someone to fill that vacancy, and they decided to change the name. And they no longer were looking for a pastor. They were looking for a life coach. In their church, they, they were wanting to interview uh, men to come in and be a life coach. My friend, listen, I, I've read through this book a time or two, and not one time have I read in this book where God's church was to be led by a life coach. Amen? Amen. That it is to be a pastor, a man of God, called to preach the Word of God, to shepherd and to take care and to look over the people and not a life coach. My friend, listen, I'm not a coach, I'm a pastor. But in our world today, churches have abandoned the gospel for the feel-good pep talks. Doctrine doesn't matter as long as you enjoy it. I believe there are some people would listen to any man preach anything as long as he could make it entertaining. They really could care less if it's doctrine or not. They could care less if it's the Bible or not. They could care less where he got it from. As long as he can present it in an entertaining way, they'll listen to anything. It's kind of like giving medicine to a dog. You try to give him a pill, he won't take it. Wrap it up in a good old piece of ham and he'll swallow it whole. Amen? And there's a lot of people today swallowing a lot of stuff. Why? Because it's wrapped up in a juicy piece of ham and we just swallow it and we pay no attention to whether or not it's the doctrine and whether or not it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my friend, that is, that's, that's the line of which it all is judged by. If you're listening to somebody that's not preaching you the word, you need to listen to somebody else. If we're going to tell people that everything they do and how they're living is okay and just be as you are and believe whatever you want, then why are we trying to introduce them to Jesus? Think about that for a moment. If people are going to come into the churches and we're just going to say, you know what, we've all got it rough, we're all going through hard things, but everything's all right, God's going to take care of us all, we're all just doing the best we can, now go out and live life and just do the best that you can do. If we're going to tell them that, why are we trying to introduce them to Jesus? You have an encounter with Jesus, it'll change you. Amen? And the thing is, we ain't all right. <laughs> we're sinners. We're all sinners, lost, hell bound. We're in need of a Savior. If we're all okay, just live the best you can, do the best you can, all that good stuff, then why was Jesus nailed to a cross? Why was he beaten? Why was a crown of thorns put on his head? Why did he bear the sins of the world? If we're all okay and we're just going to do the best we can to get there, why did Jesus die on a cross? 
Why do we spend the thousands of dollars we spend as a church to try to reach people with the gospel of the message and tell them about Jesus if everybody's okay? Folks, everybody's not okay. There's some people that have their name written in the Lamb's book of life and they're going to stand before the Lord one day and hear Him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But there's a whole lot of people that are lost and they're going to die and go to hell if they don't trust Christ as their personal Savior. Amen? Amen. So we've got to get away from that. We've got to be careful what we are telling people and what we are preaching to people. And Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, there's going to come some perilous days. There are going to come some dangerous days. There's going to come a time when people are going to turn away from the truth and they're going to want you to preach them something to their itching ears. They're going to want something that will entertain them. They're going to want something that's going to just make them feel good about themselves. And they're not going to want to hear the truth. But what did Paul tell Timothy to do? Preach the word. Preach the word. They're not going to want to hear it. They're not going to want to endure it. But you just keep preaching the word. That was what Paul told Timothy to do. I read something this week and I wrote it down because I wanted to say it just like I read it. It says, we have come to a point in Christianity where people do not care if you can back it up with the Bible. Their feelings... Their desires and emotions override what the Scripture says. They don't follow Christ, they follow self. Can you say amen to that? We've come to a place where we don't care if you can back it up with the Bible. People say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. This is what I believe. This is what I have been taught my whole life. My friend, listen, what we believe as individuals and what we have been taught our whole life, if it is not in line with the anointed and the inspired Word of God, then I'm wrong and you're wrong. Regardless. We don't follow Christ, we follow self. I can remember a day and time where as a pastor, if there was someone in the church that needed church discipline, if there was something that needed to be addressed, you went to that individual as a pastor and you talked to that person and you, you talked to them about whatever the need was and stuff and you prayed with them and you counseled with them and your goal was restoration. Your goal was for them to repent and to be restored to the congregation. But what we see nowadays, you, you, if you go up to somebody and you, you confront them with the sin in their life, they just get mad and move on to somewhere else where they won't be confronted with their sin. Pure and simple. I'll just go down the road. I'll just, it's happened here. It, I, it's probably happened in any Bible believing, Bible preaching church on the planet that people just move on. Why? They don't care what the Bible says. They only care about what they believe, their feelings, their desires, their flesh, what they want. This is what I think. This is what I feel. This is how I am. And I'm not changing for anybody. But you better be in fear when you stand before God one day. But here's the thing I love about the Word of God. It never points out a problem that it doesn't give you the solution. Amen? I, I said, I've said you know, many years in the ministry that you've got people who, they're the complainers. That they'll, if there's a problem, they are sure to point the problem out. And I'm okay with that as long as when you point the problem out, you come to me with a solution for it. Amen? It, point out the problem, but be sure and be ready to give me a solution for the problem. Because if all you're going to do is point out the problems and you never offer a solution, I don't want to hear it. Amen? Amen? I think that would work good in our factories, our offices, and everywhere else, not just in the church. Amen? Amen. You're going to point out the problem, then point out a solution. And I love the Word of God because the Word of God never points out a problem that it doesn't give you the solution. Paul was telling Timothy, he said, Timothy, there's some dangerous days coming. There's perilous times coming. And he goes through verses of listing all of these various evils that are going to come into our world. But then Paul says, but Timothy, listen. Paul tells Timothy to stick with the Word of God. In verse 10, he tells him to stick to doctrine. What is doctrine? It is the teachings of the Word of God. We don't hear that word in our churches a lot anymore. But friend, doctrine is important. 
people go and they join up with churches and every organization in the world and they don't investigate what they believe and what they're preaching and what they're teaching. They just go in, they enjoy the music, they enjoy this or whatever, and they have no clue what is being, what is being preached or taught in that place. When Paul was preaching or writing to Timothy, he told him the solution was to stick to doctrine to stick to the Word of God, to stick to the godly example. Paul tells Timothy, he says, Timothy, you have seen my life. You have heard what I preach. You have heard what I taught. I have trained you. I have taught you the things of God. He said, I have been a godly example to you. And he said, Timothy, stick with that. He said, you have been taught the Word of God by your grandmother and your mother. You have had godly examples before you. Stick with that. Young people, listen to me. Many of you have got godly parents, godly mothers and fathers who have raised you from babies in the house of God. Do not abandon what they have taught you. Do not turn away from the sound doctrine that they have put in you. You go off to school. You go here and you go there. Let me encourage you, my friend, to remember the godly examples that have been set before you. Our home church there in Greenville, growing up as a young boy, There'd be times when some of those older godly examples would get on my nerves. I thought, them old fuddy-duds, you know, they just don't understand us young people. And a few days I woke up and realized I was one of them (laughs) fuddy-duds. Amen. I grew up, now all of a sudden that's what I'm doing to the young people here. I become one of them. And you will too, Lord, let you live long enough. Paul said, stick with doctrine. He said, follow the godly example that you have. He even tells Timothy to have purpose. Do you have purpose in your Christian walk this morning? Or are you, do you just kind of wander around with no direction, with no purpose, with no meaning to what you're doing? Is there a purpose behind how you're living and what you're doing and raising your children? Paul tells Timothy to have faith, to believe in God. The Bible tells us that the just lives by faith. We must have our faith in God, our faith in the Word of God, even faith in one another to encourage and help one another. Paul tells Timothy to keep a godly character. And in verse 14 he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And when I read that verse, and was preparing for the message today, there's something I used to hear as a kid. I'd hear a lot of the older people say, you know what, we just got to keep on keeping on. How many of you ever hear the old saints say that? We just got to keep on keeping on. That's exactly what Paul told Timothy. He said, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. You just got to keep on keeping on. You know why? Because there's going to be days when you get discouraged. And there's going to be days when you want to give up. And there's going to be days when you want to lay it down. There's going to be days when you're frustrated. Days when you're going to be mad. Days when things are not going to go your way. But Paul told Timothy, you just got to keep on keeping on. You got to stick with it. You can't stop. You can't lay it down. You can't just give up. You can't just walk away from it. You've got to stick with what you know. You've got to do what you know God has called you to do. You've got to hang in there. And just because others have abandoned the truth and godliness doesn't mean you have to. Just because other churches do it doesn't mean we got to do it. Just because your neighbors down the road are doing it don't mean that you've got to do it. Just because we live in perilous times, just because we live in an ungodly society doesn't mean that we as the people of God have to abandon our conviction and abandon our godliness. Just because others are doing it, we don't have to do it. Paul said, preach the word. You say, well, Brother Tim, I'm not called to preach. Yes, you are. You may not be called to to pastor a church, but we're all called to preach. We are all called to proclaim the Word of God. We may not all be ordained ministers, but we're all, if we're saved, if we've trusted Christ as our personal Savior, we have been given a declaration from God to preach, to declare His Word, to speak His Word, and to live His Word through our life. And I'll close with this, doctrine. It'll teach you right. 
You need to know what you believe and you need to know why you believe it. Doctrine, it'll teach you right. Paul speaks of reproof. It'll tell you right. If you don't have somebody that'll stand before you and preach on sin, you need to find somebody else. Sometimes when you preach the Word of God, it reproves and it rebukes. He also said correction, it'll set you right. And instruction, it'll lead you right. You can't go wrong by following the Word of God. You can't go wrong by preaching the Word of God. You can't go wrong by teaching it. You can't go wrong by singing about it. You can't go wrong by reading it to your family. You can't go wrong by memorizing it. You can't go wrong by living your life by it. You can't go wrong by raising your family and your children by it. You can't go wrong by doing your business and your finances by it. You can't go wrong by treating others around you by what this book says. You can't go wrong with what this Bible tells us. And that's exactly what Paul was leaving to Timothy. Timothy. Paul was directing Timothy back to the gospel, back to the doctrine, back to the teachings, back to the godly example. He was saying, if you want to get through these perilous times, you better stick with the Word of God. And friend, as we face 2019, who knows? Who knows? We don't know what will come in the next five minutes. But as 2019 knocks on our door, we need to take the heeding that Paul gave to Timothy and we need to stick with the Scriptures. And that's how you need to live your daily life. That's how you need to raise your family. That's how as a church we need to operate our ministries. It's by what the Word of God says. Pure and simple. If you don't think we're not living in the last days, you've got your head stuck in the sand somewhere. And I hope that you'll look around and know this, that our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in President Trump. Listen, the other day, the Dow Jones had the largest gain, one day gain in the history of the stock market. Over a thousand points. That's good. Man, those of you that's got money in the stock market, great. That's wonderful. Just wait, it'll go back down. Amen? Those of you that are Republicans, oh, you're excited, man. You've got your man in the office. You're great. Just hang on. It'll change. There'll be a Democrat in there. And the other crowd will be happy then. Right? Gas is $1.80 something a gallon. Woohoo! You can go back to driving your tanks and all that other stuff and your Hummers and all that other stuff that gets about a half a mile to the gallon. You can drive all that stuff and everything. That's great. Woohoo! What's wonderful? Just wait. It'll go back up. All the stuff you've put your hope and your trust in, your faith, all that's great. Man, the housing market. Some of you have sold homes and made a killing. That's all right. Wait till you file your taxes. Wait till you pay that capital gains tax on that house. Or just wait till the market b- b- uh, blows up again and, and, and what you own ain't worth anything. The point I'm making is this. You put your hope and trust in a lot of things. It's going to change. It's going to fail you. It's it's all going to go from one side to the other. You better put your hope in God. You better put your hope in the Word of God. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the only hope we have. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord Jesus, thank you for the infallible, inerrant, unchanging Word of God. And Lord, from what we read this morning, all Scripture is inspired of God. And it is profitable. Profitable. Everybody's looking for a prophet. But Lord, you've told us the Word of God is profitable if we'll live by it. As the great warrior of the cross, Paul, was coming down to the end, Lord... You impressed upon him to write to Timothy and tell him, stick with the Word. Preach the Word. Stick with what you know is right. Because there are going to be some dangerous days that lie ahead. Lord, today we're living in dangerous times. So help us as fathers and mothers to raise our children according to the Word of God. Help us as grandparents to be examples to our grandchildren and to teach them what is right and to raise them in the ways of the Lord and to be that godly example. Help us as 
pastors and teachers to stay true to the Word of God, to, to preach the Word of God, and to teach it, all of it, the good, the bad, the hard, the sweet, the bitter. That God, we would declare the whole counsel of God. But God, in 2019, I pray that you'll help us. That, Lord, we would be a shining light to the lost that are around us. People that have put their faith and their hope in the things of the world, and it's only going to fail them. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to remain true to the mission and to the message and to the calling that you've put upon us. Lord, as a church, we look forward to a new year that, Lord, great things could happen. Lord, we, we pray that things will move forward, that we could break ground and build a new sanctuary. And Lord, as your word said, we'll go out into the highways and the hedges and we'll compel them to come in, that your house may be full. The Lord will see souls saved and lives changed. But Lord, we can't do it without you. And Lord, as we make that transition, we want to do it, Lord, with your anointing and your power and your presence to be over everything that is said and done. And Lord, that you would get the glory for it all. Lord, I thank you for going to a cross and dying for my sin. Because without it, I would be hell bound with no hope. But thanks be to God. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you this morning. We give you praise and we give you thanksgiving. I want to ask you to stand this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. And as the music is played, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Not asking you if you're a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever. I'm asking you, are you saved? Are you born again? Do you have that hope and that promise in your heart this morning? Friend, if you can't answer in the affirmative, we'd love to pray for you this morning. Just by lifting your hand, you'd say, Brother Tim, remember me when you pray. Is there one anywhere in the house? God bless you. God bless you. Are there others? God bless you. Are there others? Are there others? God bless you. God bless you. God sees these hands. My friend, listen. We are in the last days. And God's Spirit is speaking to men and women, boys and girls, for them to come and trust Him as their Savior. And I beg of you this morning, would you do that? Would you just come and say, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. And I want you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Wash my sins away. Friend, the Bible said, if you will confess Him with your mouth, if you will believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, He will save you. Will you come? Will you come? While we wait just a moment. You realize and see the need in your life. But what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? While we wait. Will you come? And friend, we're going to do exactly what we said we'd do. We're going to pray for you. But my prayer is going to be that you won't be able to think about anything else other than your spiritual situation this morning. Until you come to a place of salvation. Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to these hearts. People who have confessed by lifting their hand that they know that, Lord, they're not where they need to be with God. Lord, I, I pray for the Spirit to bring conviction upon their hearts. Lord, that in this new year they could start it out. Lord, knowing that their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're saved. And Lord, because of what Christ done on the cross, they stand before you whole and righteous. I pray for the needs of our church, the families that are here. Lord, I pray your blessing upon them. I pray for healing to the sick. I pray for financial blessing to those, Lord, that are struggling. 
I pray for peace to, to those, Lord, that in their spirits are being tormented and troubled. Lord, this morning we love you, we give you praise, and we give you thanksgiving. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Are you glad you come today? Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good, and we appreciate you being in the service. We will have service tonight at 5 o'clock. And uh, we'll have a short time of business, and we'll talk with this uh, some more, and then we'll be bringing something from the Word of God tonight. So we'll be praying about that. Wednesday night, hope that you'll come. We'll be having our regular Wednesday night services. Uh, that'll be January the 2nd, so uh, hope that you'll come and be a part of that. And then next Sunday, first Sunday of the year, make it, make it just your goal, your plan to be in the house of the Lord and uh, let's fill this place up. Let's dismiss this morning. God bless you for being here. Appreciate you so much. And as we bow and dismiss, Brother Donnie Smith, would you dismiss us in prayer this morning?